Hello, hello everyone here on the main stage at MagicCon Las Vegas. My name's Riley Knight and it's my great pleasure to bring to you our very first panel for our Sunday here in Vegas. We're going to kick things off in style with an art panel, the world of art for the wilds of L Train. What you're about to see is a peek behind the curtain, a look at the nitty gritty of how worlds like L Train are brought to life through the art and the story that the cards tell. And on this panel, we've got some fine folks that are going to give you uh, a lot of insight as to how this process uh, gets underway. We've got concept artists and illustrators, Jason Engel, Evan Fong. We've got people from inside the building at Wizards. We've got Deborah Garcia and Neil LaPlante Johnson, art directors and narrative directors. But it's my great pleasure to announce the host of this panel. You're in fine hands. You're in a safe pair of hands as we get underway with the world of art today. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming to the stage the one and only Sam Gallio from Ristic Studies. Good morning. Woo! Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. A nice 11 a.m. panel in Las Vegas. Uh, this is a perfect way to ease into the day as is the kind of the brand and the style we're talking about arts, we're talking about world building, and it's going to be a nice, relaxing uh, conversation. Uh, as Riley said, I have four guests with us, uh, a couple of people that worked on the concept and final card illustrations. We'll introduce them in a second. My goal with these panels is always to give you um, just a couple of tidbits, that's, those, those fine level details that when you come here, you can then go and look at some, like a, an L drain card and say, hey, I know why this fairy is shaped the way that it is. I have a cool insight that this giant is, looks different than the giants that we find on other planes. Um, so today's, today's talk is all about that. It's all about Eldraine. Um, I'm sure you've seen the Sir Ginger cosplay running around, but that brings me infinite joy. I want you to think of that image um, and sort of the installation that they have over there with the thrones and the food, because this set is very whimsical. It's very fun. It's very silly. And the, the gingerbread people are kind of emblematic of exactly that, you know? And what other worlds can you, can you eat food tokens, you know, that double as knights? So that's basically the, uh, the energy and the sort of feel and I'm excited to get into the details. So without further ado, please welcome the um, four guests from Wizards of the Coast to the stage and put your hands together. Let's hear it. OK, so. Let's get started. I'll have you guys introduce yourselves one by one. So first to my left, Deborah. Yeah, um, I'm Deborah Garcia. I'm an art director on Magic's world building team. Um, I am one of the two lead art directors for Wilds of Eldraine. Andrew Vallis was the other art director. He established the visual world building for the set, and I executed that vision through the card art. Wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, my name is Neil LaPlante Johnson. I'm a narrative designer at Wizards of the Coast and the world building lead of Wilds of Eldraine, alongside a lot of talented folks, Roy Graham, Doug Beyer. I helped establish how the world of Eldraine came to life in our first return to the setting. Great. Evan, go ahead. Hi, I'm Evan. Um, I work as a concept artist and illustrator on a lot of the sets you guys have played. The first set I did illustrations for was Theros Beyond Death, and the first uh, set I did concepts for was Kamigawa and Neon, Neon Dynasty, one of my favorites. So nice to meet you guys. Yeah, great. Thank you. And yeah, Jason. Yeah, my name is Jason Engel. I'm an illustrator for Magic, and I've done a bit of concept art for them as well. I've participated in four concept pushes. Um, my first one was, uh, was Ravnica 3, and it was so much fun. I had to come back and do it again a few times. Wonderful. So we're on Eldrain. We're on Eldrain for the second time. It was a few years back that, uh, that we visited the world for the first time. When you come to a world uh, for the second time, at the level of art direction and illustration, you have to establish some new visual language. Uh, the big question mark is, well, what are we going to do different this time? What's new? What's been happening since we've been gone? So just from the top line, Deborah, what was the goal kind of going into the very beginning of the push? What were you all looking at uh, for the for the return to Eldrain. Yeah, so Andrew and I talked about this a lot. Uh, we wanted to establish 
a different tone, something that was uh, that could take place after the Phyrexian invasion, that still had residual effects of that invasion, but uh, tonally shifted into something more whimsical, more fun, uh, more humorous. Uh, we wanted to avoid going really dark, but still dark enough in the way that fairy tales traditionally are, um, and just give the artists a, a, like something fun to work with, uh, like move away from uh, a more bleak tone uh, and just, yeah, have a lot of fun, really lean into the humor. Wonderful. Um, we're looking at kind of a, a, a vision of uh, the, the, the Ice Queen. I think one of the other goals for, especially for the narrative team, right, is to, to have fairy tales that everyone recognizes. That's something that was important for you at the visual, at the visual level and also for you as, as, as the narrative team, right? Neil, is that, is that something you could say? Yeah. Yeah, of course. When we're looking at what fairy tales are in the public conscious, what like sparks your imagination and joy, we wanted to make sure that when you looked at the cards and you looked at each illustration, you could recognize at a glance what kind of fairy tale you were looking at, like what story we were telling. But these are archetypal, deep, resonant cultural tropes that we're playing with here. Um, so it's just picking out what is cool, what is resonant, what we all know, and then adding that little magic twist, little flair, um, and kind of incorporating it into what magic would do with those tropes and setting. Wonderful. Um, okay, so like we said, uh, there's been a bit of time passing. Most recently, the Phyrexians took over every plane in the multiverse, and Neil told me, he's like, my team, we wanted, if we were going to go back, we wanted to make sure we could feel that. So what's happened after, after the invasion? Like, what took place on Eldraine? Yeah, so during the invasion, there was a plane-wide spell cast on Eldraine to slow down the Phyrexians. It was called the Wicked Slumber. You might have recognized that card when you were opening up a March of the Machine pack. Um, but now, months after the invasion has concluded, the Wicked Slumber is still happening over the entire plane. So there's kind of a mystery there, like what is going on? How do we solve this? This is a big archetypal quest. And we wanted to make sure that there was a direct connection. People come to magic to have these strong narratives over the course of set after set after set, and making sure there was a continuity, there was something that bound these two together, and there were consequences for this Phyrexian invasion. It didn't feel like we wiped the slate clean. While we had this breath, breath of fresh air, we still wanted you to feel like this is new, this is exciting, and there's actual consequences to the things that we did in the last set. What about at the visual level? Um, how, how do you communicate uh, sleep? It's not very uh, thrilling to show characters, you know, uh, halfway through their slumber. What did you need to do visually to make sure that was communicated? Oh, yeah. Um, Andrew and I talked about how this was one of the really big challenges of the set because we wanted to establish, like, a visual manifestation for the wicked slumber that was you know, tonally uh, like sinister, but still really beautiful, uh, something that represented uh, the visual through lines of the set. So like it has a, like a vine-like appearance sometimes, like it, it is a manifestation of grief, trauma, and nightmares. So it has thorns, it looks like a, like a creeping vine that like uh, sweeps throughout the plane, it affects citizens, and how it affects citizens. So. During the concept push, I know that that was something that was really explored. That it was a, a that required a solve. Uh, that there were explorations into how it affects people physically, like what it does to their bodies, um, their their faces, and like uh, how it moves them. Like Andrew always said that he never wanted it to look like they were zombies. Like mm. uh, that he wanted them to look peaceful, and that's like the 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 sinister nature of the wicked slumber. So a lot of exploration and a lot of leaning into the visual motifs. And Jason, Jason, you kind of had to deal with this just pragmatically. It's so easy to talk like, ah, just make them not look like zombies, make them look sinister. But you have to take those words and turn them into, you know, images. What was that challenge like for you? Um, well, it, it started out pretty difficult. Uh, but actually, it was Jehan that, that managed to figure out how to do it just right. Uh, it's, the, one of the best things about working on concept art on these pushes is the, uh, the collaborative work that you sort of experience working with other artists that are at the just top level of the business. You, uh, you have so much trust in what they're doing, but when you see an opportunity to build on it or to 
see an element that almost works and you know exactly what the target is and you just sort of get a moment of inspiration where you can bridge that gap for them, um, you know, that's what the collaboration is all about. Yeah. And again, the biggest visual solve for you is like, they can't look dead, they have to look asleep, right? It's, right? Very, <laughs> it's very easy to sort of misinterpret a person who is sleepwalking and say, being controlled and trying to fight another character as looking just like a zombie stumbling around. I mean, there's virtually no difference whatsoever. So you really have to, uh, you have to add in certain magical effects to it and you have to uh, almost make them look more like marionettes, really. Um, because if they look too aggressive or controlled, then they look sort of monstrous, and you just want them to look sort of almost relaxed, but still moving, but, you know, asleep. And, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of things at once that are not easy to do. I will say that even in this image you're seeing, um, March of the Machine was defined by the color magenta. Magenta was overwhelming in terms of a lot of the briefs. It's a brighter pink. Um, yeah. Purple was the visual cue for the slumber, and you can see that at the level of the cards. Even uh, that kind of transcends, goes to the packaging. If you think of Eldraine now, you, you see a lot of purple, and Magic likes to ground uh, you know, the world in, in, in a color if it can help it. So you see some of the, the wicked slumber. Um, purple was an important part of that visual solve. Mm -hmm. um, but like we said, we're back on Eldraine, and fairy tales are the name of the game. Uh, the whimsical fairy tales. So how does this differ a little bit from that first iteration on fairy tales um, for you, Deborah? What was, uh, what, was that, what was that like for you? Well, like from Throne of Eldraine? Yeah, so well, from the first Eldraine sure. set, so yeah. So Throne of Eldraine was focusing more on the knights um, and the chivalry of uh, like Arthurian knights. Um, I recall Andrew saying that the, like the fae, for instance, like were a lot more, like certainly not as whimsical. Um, so when we came to um, to Wilds of Eldraine, again leaning into that whimsy for for the like the Fae, for instance, um, across all of the different factions, um, that goofiness, like we like, and, and that applies to the the different fairy tales as well. We still wanted them to be recognizable for uh, people to have like a a, a place of reference. Uh, for all of these fairy tales, they have a very, you know, dark traditional, um, like, uh, space that, like, uh, from, like, Grimm's fairy tales, but, um, like, people's exposure to fairy tales over time, as it's modernized, um, it gets a, a little, you know, less dark, a little bit more, um, like, accessible, and so we're trying to balance that out, like, with these, like, um, have them be really recognizable, um, but still, you know, apply them to the different characters. Um, and, you know, make them cool. Yeah. You know, make them powerful, fun, um, uh, elaborate on their costuming and, you know, their effects and what they can do and uh, how they interact and, like, references to their stories. And, Neil, I mean, just looking at this image, this is... Uh... This is on the Arthurian Knights kind of side, right? So this is, you're looking at the British Isles and, and that old yeah. tradition for the first set. Yeah, this is taking place in Edgewall. This is from our um, Pied Piper inspired story with Totten Tans and this rat swarm and Lord Skitter, this giant demonic rat that lives in the sewers. Um, and you can see the European architectural influence. Um, but the, the big thing here was in Throne of Eldraine, we had one card fairy tales which would be something like Love Struck Beast, where it's like, oh, it's a big creature and it makes a 1-1 one, one human token. Here, we had the challenge of let's extrapolate and make everything a massive vertical slice. Like, every single part of that gets its own card. So here we're seeing, as Totem Tance is dragging, you know, is playing his little pipe and dragging people along through Edgewall, we're getting one kind of slice of these fairy tales, which is in contrast to Throat of Eldraine, where this would be the only card we might see. We had Piper of the Swarm, now we have Totem Tans and an entire archetype. So, very cool. Uh, the next image is a fairy tale you will recognize immediately. I do not even have to describe it. That's something we all grew up with. And again, it's, it's right there with the visual language, right? It's that color of that hood. <laughs> Jason, you kind of worked with this concept. Mm -hmm. I like seeing this image because we'll see something later that, that plays into it. Um, what is it like for both of you to work at the level of concept and then also have to deal with illustrations on the cards. I'm always interested in that conversation. You mentioned it's very collaborative, 
but you have to put a bunch of ideas on the paper and then turn those into final pieces. Um, what's that like for you? Is that fun for you, Evan? Yeah, so for, um, just for some background information for how these concept pushes work, so they hire like a bunch of artists to come together in one digital room nowadays, and they give us the basis for the set, like for Eldraine. It was kind of like we're going back to Eldraine. We want to make it a little more silly, a little more whimsical, reference some of these fairy tales that we kind of spoke about in the first set but kind of shied away from. We want to make that like a major aspect of what the set's going to be. So they give us kind of like a very high level overview and they say like, okay, so we need slumber, we need high fae, we need witches, we need giants, right? And we need you guys to think of interesting ways to make these different from every other magic set that's ever been before, interesting to players, and also easy for the illustrators to see in this world guide, which we hand out to them, and then interpret it in their own way to make these beautiful illustrations that you guys see. So it's a really hard job, but for me, it's one of the most fun things, because I think as a magic player, to get to have some say in like how things are going to look, you know, like what kind of mechanics you think would be cool, even like suggesting little ideas like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if these two were like partner commanders or like even like the Goose Hydra, which uh, came out in this set, came from like just a stupid conversation that we had about like, wouldn't it be funny if there was a Goose Hydra? And now it's one of the most popular characters that came out. Same thing with the, the bee sheep that I did. It was just like <laughs> a little joke we made. And I did like a five minute drawing and they were like, that's it put that in. And I was like, this? This little thing I made? And then it made all the way to the final card. So it's, it's a really fulfilling and fun experience for us to get to work on the set. Yeah, as we pan some, through some more of the concept, uh, concept work before we arrive at the setting, uh, we, were in the, we were in the rehearsal meeting, and <laughs> Evan and, and, and Jason and everybody were laughing at the word beep. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, why is everyone beeping at each other? And then they spelt it out, and it's B-H-E-E-P, like a a bee sheep, okay? That's a beep, okay? <laughs> now you're in, in on the joke, in on the, but that's, but that's the whimsy that comes from the concept. Like, just have a bunch of ideas, throw stuff at the wall, and then sometimes, accidentally, the big inside joke becomes a yeah. part of the visual solve for the set. So if you see beeps around, now you know how to spell it and what it's all about, <laughs> right? So, um, and Jason, again, same question, like uh, concept level, do you like the concept side? Uh, just as much as the illustration? Like, what's the fun and joy of the concept rush for you? Well, I've, I've been doing art in, uh, in the games business for about 25 years, and uh, most of that time has been spent doing full illustration work. Um, and so when I got the opportunity to start doing concept work for Magic, uh, it really was uh, sort of identifying a part of the job that I hadn't really realized I loved so much previously, which was the the design that goes into costuming, the design that goes into world building, and even background design, and telling a story with a, with a full illustration is something that uh, concept work really is, you know, it's that entire process, but without all that boring rendering that comes after you. <laughs> um, and so I, I really realized that was something that I absolutely just fell in love with almost immediately. Um, and, but then taking those designs and getting to use them in a final illustration is, is actually even more fun because you feel like you're, you're taking all these foundational elements that you created and were inspired by and had different ideas around and, uh, and you're getting to use those to sort of fully realize you know, the, the final art that uh, when you're doing the concepts, you try to imagine how the artists are gonna use them, right? Uh, because that's part of the job. You know, when you're, uh, when you're doing blue giants with, uh, you know, that live in the clouds and their, their, their backgrounds are gonna be blue skies, like, it's a, it's a potential problem. So you make them grayish instead of just, you know, sky colored. Uh, and uh, you identify those little problems as you go along. So getting to sort of turn those ideas into a finished piece of art, is, uh, it's that much more fulfilling. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful part of the process. Let's talk about the setting. We have to build this world first and foremost. You have to make it believable and lived in. Um, one of the first kind of three pillars of the world uh, is something called the Bramble. And we'll find an image of the Bramble, but what is the Bramble? What's going on with the Bramble um, at the level of AD for you? Yeah, so uh, Andrew also called those the Briar. Um, the Briar was one of the visual motifs that was just very present throughout uh, in, in fashion, in, in costuming, and especially in the environment. Uh, like uh, briars, tangles, vines, thorns. It was something that was present in Throne of Eldraine, so we still wanted to work within that space, that recognizability. Um, 
Andrew really wanted the environments to feel really dense and uh, disorienting, really hard to navigate. And that tangle uh, helped create that sense of like not knowing where you are, but also like inviting a traveler to like move within those spaces, potentially into doom. Um, and it was so disorienting, for instance, that you would not be able to see the horizon. And that's something that's really prevalent throughout the entire set. Cool. Um, another motif that shows up and that helps you instantly recognize we're on Eldrain is doorways. And it might seem silly, like, OK, there's doors on every plane. But doorways, the shape of doorways and arches is a huge identifier for Eldrain. But that carries with it some symbolic meaning, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, curious and dangerous pathways. Um, it, it, it really like calls back to that traditional uh, sense of like the curious fairy tale. Um, Andrew said that he wanted it to to reach back into that place of like your childhood understanding of fairy tales, where like you don't know what's around the corner, um, and that you go at your own peril. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, it's something that we tried to emphasize with these archways is throwing them onto basic lands and making sure that when you open up a pack of Throne of Eldraine, you can play that land and feel like you're stepping through it into this fairy tale, through the briars, into the wilds, like you're actually participating and able to play in this world that we built. Yeah, the, the common trope is, is the blending of our world into something mystical and fantastic and the incorporation of magic. And the, the doorway and the arch can be that visual identifier. We have to go through it. Mm -hmm. We have to leave the castles behind. We go into the woods, and the woods are scary. They look scary. They're out to get you. I mean, think of even the, the musical that I cannot name <laughs> for legal purposes. But think of that, right? You got to go into the wilds uh, and get into trouble. So that's the third part of, like, again, the visual language. We're leaving the castles behind. We're, look at that. Do you want to be there? You know? Um, but that's part of the fairy tale motif, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and when it came to Throne of Eldraine, we had all those Arthurian Knights, as Deborah mentioned earlier. Uh, but because of the consequences of March of the Machine and a lot of the castles being destroyed, like Arden Vale and Lockswain, um, we had to be like, let's resituate ourselves. Let's take ourselves out of the knightly realm and into the wild. So it gave us a great excuse and a great twist on the return to. We got to play with something that was entirely different than the first time you came to Eldraine. We're also feeding you Easter eggs and knights wherever we could to make you feel like this is still the same world. So there's a story where uh, we can get out of the woods and go directly into the sky. Uh, who lives in the sky and why? And how do we get there? These are up in the clouds. Uh, Jason, you kind of took the lead on, on the first creature type of, of this world. Um, we have the setting. We know what we're looking at. But now we have to populate it with creatures. So tell me about the folk that live in, in, in the clouds, will you? <laughs> uh, yeah, the cloud giants. Uh, Basically, uh, when we start working on a push, uh, we pick our own targets initially, but as we go through it, eventually the art director takes a stronger and stronger role. Uh, and the Cloud Giants were one of the factions that I got assigned pretty early on. Um, I had done one of the one of the Giants cards from the previous Eldraine, the, uh, the Beanstalk Giant, so I was kind of familiar with the anatomy uh, of what the Giants of Eldraine needed to look like. Um, and that was really all I had to work from because uh, we hadn't really explored that before. It hadn't been a, a concept that came up. Um, so it was, it was kind of, uh, it's what we call blue sky design work at that point. Um, but uh, I knew the, the color pie, which is one of those nice frameworks that Magic has to help with design, told me they needed to be uh, blue and green, uh, which was uh, an interesting challenge. Uh, but I figured, well, they have the beanstalks that are green, so. That was also the only uh, resource that I knew they were going to have available to them, because at the time, we didn't know what kind of landscape they were going to have in the clouds. Um, so I decided that maybe their clothing could be woven out of beanstalk fibers, and that would be the green element. And then their, their skin could be kind of a bluish gray tone, and that would make every image with one of them in it sort of blue and green all on its own. Um, and I knew I needed to kind of build a little bit of a culture around it as well. Uh, and the first Eldran had focused mo mainly on, on Celtic and Gaelic uh, cultural influences. So I tried to use some of those to sort of give me a, a baseline for what their clothing looked like and how their armor worked. Um, and so I tried to work that in as much as possible as well. And, and then I added some whimsy uh, because that's what the set is all about. 
uh, which is where I got the idea for the, the hair kind of trailing into misty clouds to sort of signify that they are you know, a more magical kind of giant than the others that we've seen previously. Um, and I wanted to sort of build their, their society a little bit as well and figure out what other kind of resources they could harness. Living in the clouds, I knew they'd have access to lightning, so I figured it would be kind of cool if they walked around with like bottled lightning uh, you know, that they could use as, as an energy source or something. Um, and the, uh, the goose keeper that's in the image here was one of the first pieces I did, actually. Um, I thought it would be fun if, uh, if they basically had uh, the golden geese, but they kept them uh, almost like a herd of, or, or a flock of geese, uh, where they sort of farmed them like bees because they're very, very small compared to a giant. Um, and I, uh, I put a, a top of a tower on his head because it kind of looked like a beekeeper mask. Uh, so it's, it's about finding those visual uh, similarities to other things that sort of communicate a concept in, in short form uh, to anyone that looks at it. And that's what I came up with there. And it, it kind of, it, it sort of helped define their culture a little bit all at once, which was really fun. And when I put in the, uh, the, the geese as part of their culture, we realized that was kind of an animal type that would be appropriate for living in the clouds with them. Maybe that was something that we'd see a lot more of. Uh, and that's when someone did a, uh, a sketch of the goose hydra. Uh, which, of course, ended up in the marketing material and all of that. And that was really just one of those throwaway ideas that just sort of evolved from various things. Yeah, you just throw stuff at the wall, and then sometimes it sticks. You're like, oh, gosh, I didn't really, I wasn't, I was joking. That was a bit, right. you know? <laughs> it was like that. It yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, art director Zach Stella notoriously hates scale birds. Scale birds where you just throw some birds to communicate how gigantic this titan or whatever is. I like that you have other solves with the giants. Um, the cloud giants, like, oh, let's have him eating an entire gingerbread house or whatever have you mm. to, to sell that scale. And then, like Jason said, like, instead of a beekeeper's hat, it's just the top of a tower. Um, so, that, so that helps communicate size, right? The giants in the clouds. So uh, any fun tidbits from the narrative side about uh, <laughs> the cloud giants? It, not so much that Jason hasn't already eloquently explained, uh, but it was super important to have a culture. The first time we saw Eldraine, the giants were either these gigantic, esoteric, white giants that are just, you know, realm cloaked and whatnot, or they're, you know, hitting you for two damage. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Notoriously so, yeah. <laughs> Notoriously so. Harsh memories, guys. Gotcha. Um, but here yeah. it's like we had to develop a kind of what do they do in their free time. Eldraine has a pastoral vibe to it. It's fairy tales. And people in this world have jobs, funny enough. Um, they're not always fighting each other. Um, and we wanted to make sure the cloud giants weren't just hyper-violent or, you know, uh, antagonistic all the time. You could see them doing mundane things like keeping herds of geese. It's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, the mundane, exactly. Just lived in a little bit. And you see that at the level of common cards. It's, it's where you find these kinds of details. Evan, talk to me. You were so excited about uh, the fairies yeah. and all the things going on with the fairies. And like I said at the start, mm -hmm. This is, this is those details that, um, you know, you walk around the hall later on and you're like, oh, well, did you know that the fairies are designed uh, to be a sort of hive mind creature? And I could tell you why. All right. You can walk around with that swagger. Tell me, tell me, about, <laughs> tell me about the fairies, Evan. Give them yeah, some insight. Yeah, so it was really exciting for me to work on the hive fae for this set because I, as an EDH player, I run a lot of fairy decks. And I was like, I'm going to make some strong fairies. You guys can thank me for all the cool fairy decks you guys can have now. <laughs> But um, something that I was really interested in was um, the idea of the high fae was pitched to us initially as like, we want them to be fairies, but they cannot look like fairies. So what, but what they meant by that was like, they wanted them to be more powerful, kind of like higher up, like some kind of like ascended version of what a fairy could be. And what I ended up thinking of was that they are kind of basically wooden puppets controlled by these massive moats in their head that's like a some kind of like hive mind consciousness. So all of the bodies for the hive fae, if you look closely, they're made of like wood or birch or some kind of like driftwood looking material. And then inside the head is a collection of these glowing moats. And that's actually the hive fae. It's not, the, it's not all this. So something that we uh, were working on too is like kind of like taking away like the basic human ideas of like gender and things like that and trying to make them look as like alien and cool as possible without making them look scary. So. Um, that was one of the first things I tackled in this push because I was like, I want to do the fairies, you know? So I threw out like four or five designs initially and none of them really hit except for one. And that one I did was just this basic idea of a um, wooden body 
with some kind of like dandelion or like a nutshell head with these moats inside. And then one of the other concept artists on the push, uh, one of my favorites, Jesper Azing, was also on it. And he was working in Denmark. He saw it. And he was like, Evan, this is a really good idea. And I was like, you think so? And then that night, he sent me over this amazing painting that he had done based off of my concept. And I cried for like 15 minutes because I was so excited because <laughs> it was so beautiful. And he had drawn my thing. But it basically made it all the way into the final design, just the way that we had originally concepted it. So that was a really special moment for me. And I really liked the high and how they came out. The paintings are great that everyone did of them. Andrew said it was so hard, and then it was so easy <laughs> like, once you got that idea down. He was like, yeah. ah, I feel is. like that's concept art in general is you don't get it for a really long time, and then when you get it, you're like, this is perfect. Yep. You can't change it. Yeah. It's like hiding in plain sight when it solved perfectly. You also mentioned that uh, you were looking at Tomatillo plans. Yeah. Right? yeah. So when um, there's like certain things that are very fantasy-like to me about like berries with like casings, like Tomatillos, and I think they're called like ground cherries. These little fruit balls with these little like um, paper-like casings around them, and then when they die, they kind of wither away and make a very similar shape to how those heads look. Also, this idea of like glass apples. I don't know if you've seen this, but sometimes in the winter. Um, when water freezes around an apple, the apple will rot and fall out, and you're left with this beautiful, like, clear glass apple. So I really wanted to bring some of that, like, nature, but, like, something, like, really fantasy about it, that feeling into how the fae look. Awesome. Yeah. So the giants, we have the fairies. Next, Deborah is a, is a creature that's very ethereal and probably, at your level, very hard to assign. Uh, it's the wisps. What do you do with wisps? Like, how do you, how do you write a description for that, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the wisps, I mean, that was something established, uh, like, to give that flavor of the British Isles, uh, that uh, concept of the will of the wisp uh, as, like, a, a lure or uh, something that you see that can either lead you to doom or show you the way. Um, so in Eldraine, we established wisps um, as something that was inherent to every territory. So uh, like the Boundary Lands, for instance, the wisps there are helpful. So they're, they hover at eye level, and uh, they're helpful. They show the path forward. Um, in the Witch Lands, uh, they are, hover right along the ground and like emphasize like the muck of the swamp. Um, and they're, you know, those are lures. They're, they're not going to help you. They're going to lead you into doom. Um, and then, like the fey lands, the the moats uh, hover in the tree canopies and like sparkle along with the fairies, uh, neither good nor bad. Um, and it's it's again, it's a, a a visual motif that is prevalent throughout the entire set. You'll see them everywhere. You'll see them way way off into the distance, sparkling along the horizon, showing the different borders of the different territories. And then, in contrast to the fairies, I mean, maybe the wisps are leading us to the witches who very much inhabit the woods, traditionally speaking. Um, this beautiful image of the Ice Witch, I, again, I keep referencing the cosplay contest because it was excellent. We saw that come to life yesterday. Um, what's going on with witches? There's a really cool solve, Evan, um, yeah. that had to do with Magali, right? You yeah. guys were working yeah. behind the scenes. In the top, uh, uh, top left, top left of your screen, you see this witch here. Talk to me about that one specifically. Yeah, so one of, like, one of the coolest things about this push was I got to work with such cool artists like Jason and Magali and Jesper, who is, are all people I played with their cards for forever, right, as a Magic player. And I was like, that's so cool I get to work with them. So like, getting to bounce ideas back and forth with them was one of the most like, cool parts of the set. And I think that's why, in my opinion, the ideas that we came up with are so strong. So for the witches, I came up with this original concept that I had kind of sketched out, which was a witch um, dressed in kind of like a very form-fitting kind of like um, Disney, Disney witch-like dress. And then she had these shattered mirrors on either side of her. And I wanted them to kind of reflect both sides of what a witch is, right? Which is like her transforming into these different versions of herself. So I had an old version, like the old crone, and then a young, like, beautiful witch on one side, right? So then it would show both sides of who this person was. And then as she walked, there would be like uh, bits of mirror in front of her so she didn't step on the floor because she was too high, too haughty for that. So I, I put that up and then Magali was like, oh, that's cool. And then she posted this beautiful drawing which looks pretty much exactly like the final looks with the really cool collar which solved the idea that I had of like, okay, mirrors, but they kind of float, you know, which wasn't very good. And then she was like, what if they're in the collar? And I was like, that's it. So 
I'm really happy with how those look. I think it really encapsulates the idea that we had of like, um, well, the whole feel of Eldraine, where it's this core idea of like this very common fantasy thing, but done in a way that's like pays homage to that, but is also like aspirational and cool looking, you know, not just silly. So I'm really happy with that one. And then bottom left uh, is our first case study. So this, this <laughs> kind of moves the gradients, right? We have concepts and we have these intermediate il illustrations. Eventually we have to get them on the cards. Agatha. So this is one of your first explicit assignments, Jason. Mm -hmm. What were you looking at? What did you want to, what did you want to sell? And um, what do you want to communicate with this, this image here? Yeah. Um, well, Agatha was really, really interesting. Um, as we got further into the, into the push, uh, we started getting more and more clear assignments from the art director. And one of the things that he did was he assigned um, chapters, essentially, which were segments of the story that were inspired by uh, specific folklore uh, and fairy tales. Uh, and this one obviously involves a, a girl with a red hood and a, and a wolf uh, and a witch in a hut. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty classic fairy tale that we got to sort of reinterpret in magic terms. Uh, so I got, to, uh, I got to design a big bad wolf, but as a black knight. And I got to design uh, Agatha, which is one of the uh, prime examples of the, the kind of new witches of the wilds. You know, as one of the witch queens, she needed to have uh, more of a recognizable face than the witches did in the first Eldraine. She needed to have, uh, you know, a, a more kind of royal, you know, aspect to her and a, and a fancier dress. But what we decided early on, and it was actually Andrew's, uh, Andrew's idea, um, was he, uh, he sort of threw out the initial art order, in fact, uh, for the design for Agatha uh, and said her, her initial name was the Bestial Witch, uh, uh, which is a name they probably knew was going to change. Um, but the concept of it at its core was that she had to have wolf motifs and she had to have control over all these you know, natural predators and she had to have that kind of bestial aspect to her while still being pretty and royal <laughs> at the same time. Um, so what I tried to do with her was integrate little elements into her costuming that sort of betrayed what she really is underneath her camouflage. Um, and I cast her face in shadow, which is actually a, a, a common trick in movies for cinematography. When they want to show someone who's like secretly a villain or he might be lying, they'll put like a little shadow over his face. So, you know, the eyes kind of glow a little more. Um, and with her, I, I tried to include little elements, like her jewelry is made from human teeth. Um, and she has like fangs from different, you know, forest predators and all that. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun to sort of integrate all those ideas together and, and try to show something that, uh, that is, it looks like it's hiding in plain sight, like you said. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a witch, but she's wearing a, a certain glamour. So she can, you know, attract people to her hut and then eat them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe you mentioned it, but you had like a Stepford Wives kind of vibe to yeah, it, right? Yeah, that, that was, was, part that of the was Andrew's main concept was he was like, I want to throw out all of that and I want to try and do something a little weird. Tell me if you don't want to do it. We don't have to, um, but I want to give it a try. And uh, because she's, uh, she's this apex predator, we want her to wear this very distinct kind of camouflage, which is very unassuming and uh, makes you want to trust her and, and, and all of that. So uh, we want her to look kind of like a Stepford Wife, like she's too perfect but there's little things about her that are slightly creepy at the same time. Um, like, is why, that's why she has sharpened teeth, uh, which you don't even notice necessarily at first on the card, because it's very small art. Um, and then she also has these nails, which are like very well-painted, you know, red uh, fingernails, but they're so long that they're almost like claws. Um, so it was a matter of taking that core concept and sort of stretching it in little ways to match the, uh, the core concept. And then what's the witch without a bubbling, obnoxiously green cauldron, right? Like, you get, that's the final punch of this, is leaning back into the whimsy of it all, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, wonderful. OK, you love fairies. Tell me about that. You're, you're stoked about <laughs> Obira. We had a discussion. You guys can decide. It's Obira or Obira, however you'd like to hit it. But um, again, this is something you celebrated, Evan. You have so much to say about uh, this creature. Yeah. So this is one of the most fun pieces I did for, I think, all of my magic cards. Because I this is one of the few things I like really had control over from start to finish, over everything about this piece. Because I was did so much of the design work for the Haifei initially. And then um, me and Jesper actually passed the key art for this during the push, which is, oh, key art is like the original kind of um, sketch that we do for like what the card could feel like. And it's done to kind of like hand out to the illustrators to be like, here's some ideas of like the vibe of the set the vibe of this kind of um, class or a kind of creature that we have. 
So it was a real struggle because like we talked about earlier to go back to um, the sleep segment, but having someone look like they're sleepwalking, but still active and also like they're being controlled, but not against their own will because they're asleep was a big problem for us. And as we had done iteration after iteration of the original art for this, I think hopefully like for me, it helped me get a lot of bad ideas out. So by the time I got the assignment to do the final painting, I was like, okay, I know what I want to do. And I um, wanted to have it so the sleep covers her eyes, but just a little bit. So it's like, as we see her from below, you can see that she's just asleep, not in pain, not being controlled. And then her sword is up at the ready, but not too pointed, not too, you know, not swiping or anything, just kind of there. So I think that trying to integrate all of these ideas that I'd gotten from Jason and Jesper and Magali and Jehan and everyone on the set into this one illustration was super fun for me because I could kind of remember like all of the fun conversations we'd had, all of the problem solving we'd done, and all of like the inspiration I'd taken from them along the way and incorporate that into uh, a piece that I was really happy with. So like you can see too that like a lot of the inspiration I took for the cards I did for this set, not just uh, this one, were based off of kind of very old uh, oil painters. And one thing I really wanted to do was show the texture and show like how things really felt. Because when I look at old fantasy art, like um, storybook art or like Arthur Rackham stuff or things like that, something that I and I think a lot of the other illustrators for this set were really excited about was kind of bringing that fairy tale feeling into the modern era and using all the tools that we have in digital art or modern oil painting to convey the things that we love about old fantasy art in the modern card illustrations. You mentioned the weapon. That's, a, that's another detail from the concepts level, right? It's the sword that she's holding. Yeah. What's going on there? Oh, so she was based off of the idea of the sleeping, the sleeping princess, right? So the sword, if you look closely, is a spool of golden thread. So I kind of combined the ideas of Rumpelstiltskin and like the original like old uh, fairy tales and uh, combined them into this illustration. So the sword is both magic, which I think you saw in the earlier concept sheet that we had, all of the high phase weapons are just an, an item, like a rose, a branch, a stone, but they kind of grow out with magic into this whole weapon, into this whole item. So hers throws from a spindle, and you can see her holding it and the gold thread trailing off, and it comes out into this long fencing rapier. Super cool. Um, the next card is my favorite card in the set from the level of naming, card names. It's Cruel Somnophage. <laughs> The word somnophage is so awesome. I love the word somnophage. Uh, Jason, you get this assignment again. Your solve is like, we got to have some sleepwalking, uh, you know, dandelion-headed woodland creatures. Uh, talk to me about what, what's going on with this nightmare. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, one of, the, uh, one of the assignments I got uh, during the push was also the, the nightmares. We needed to figure out what they looked like. Um, and they, uh, they were kind of an interesting challenge because the, the only real uh, instructions that I had for it was that they, they could potentially, if I wanted to, um, have the silhouettes of the Phyrexians to sort of carry over that theme into the, into the set because we wanted to show at least some residual uh, sort of visual references that the Phyrexians were here and they left their mark on things. Um, and with the nightmares, we figured we could integrate it a little bit because they were kind of a physical manifestation of the fears that the people have. Because the, the entire kingdom is asleep, so these creatures are sort of lurking around and sort of preying on all of these, you know, dreaming people. Um, but the design for them, I wanted to sort of look like almost eyes in the, in the shadows in a fairy tale, uh, you know, where it's like monsters just sort of blinking from the forest at you. Um, so I wanted that to sort of define their visual look. Like I, I imagine them living in pools of shadow and sort of striking at people when, when they least expect. Um, but they also are, are faceless, you know, like the Phyrexians. They have asymmetrical body anatomy like the Phyrexians. They have lots of spikes like the Phyrexians. Um, but they also integrate uh, other designs as well, like uh, creatures that, or monsters that are just local to the, the people that, that live in this region that they would have nightmares about. So it kind of informs their physical anatomy, you know? Evil wolves and, uh, you know, scarecrows and all of those elements were integrated into the monster design as well. So for this piece, I got to use one of the creatures that I spent all that time working on their, their core design and sort of, you know, fully realize it. And I, uh, I added little textural elements. And uh, it was a neat piece to work on specifically, though, because it integrated so much of what the set has in it that's, like, visually identifying for this set. The Wicked Slumber itself, uh, is, you know, coiled around all of these high fey, which are another one of the main factions of this set. One of the nightmares is just like, 
you know, hovering over the entire group, just sort of like, I don't know, eating their dreams or something. Um, I mean, it's, it's just very emblematic of the story of where Eldraine is at during this time. And, and it's then, really kind of pretty, too. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's not undersell that you had to paint a castle in the background, too, right? right. To give us that leverage, the, the, the gazing up at this gigantic creature. Um, I, I have to admit, I love this next painting the most, Evan. Uh, it, it, it sold and it hit so many notes. Um, this is Shire. Um, this is super cool. Uh, talk to me, but this is a merfolk. We, we didn't speak specifically about merfolk, so maybe some insight from the concept. But what's happening here with Shire? Yeah, so the merfolk were also fun for me because the two things that I always ask the art directors to give me are fairies and merfolk. Those are the two things I want. I build those decks, I like those arts, I play those cards, you know. So I'm always like, hey, if there's a set with fairies and merfolk, can I, you know, can I, can I be on that? So um, I was so excited to do the merfolk for this set that I actually did the, the original sketches for them on the plane ride. Like, I think I was coming back from somewhere and they were like, do you want to work on the next El Drain? And I was like, merfolk. <laughs> so I started doing some drawings. And um, my background actually isn't in 2D art, it's in fashion. So um, something I was really inspired by was there was, I forget whose show it was, um, but there was maybe Gaultier, but there was a show where they had this idea of like the frozen Ukrainian princess, right? Which was a woman that was like dressed in all these kind of like beautiful sheer like um, princess garments with all of these like golden coins with like these dripping jewels, like she was frozen. And I was like, that's such a cool idea. I want to reference that in this uh, merfolk that we do. Because one thing that we were really interested in was that they lived in the lake, right? So most of the merfolk and magic are kind of like in the sea, you know, they're like the tide callers, right? Things that um, interact with a lot of like big space, big animals, big, open, beautiful water, right? And when you live in a frozen lake, that's a very different vibe. So I wanted them to kind of look like the idea of kind of like how in fairy tales there's so many like drowned princesses, like drowned beautiful people in the water. So all of the fins and all of like the scales, like the golden scales and stuff, I wanted to kind of emulate that idea of um, beautiful drowned things in the water that will kind of lure you in and kill you. So for this painting of Sheree, I uh, wanted her to really feel cold. So I toned down the color palette. I kind of like forced myself to work in this very restricted area to make it like to make the idea of, for the concepts that we had come across of her being in this frozen lake, beautiful but threatening, you know, freezing the lake on top of you. So, oh, yeah. Just as a little art Here. director gush, I do remember uh, uh, working with you, commissioning this, and you talking about how cold you wanted it to feel, yeah. how deep and dark, and uh, watching you like build the frost, but also like incorporate the gold coins, uh, like more evenly throughout, it really balances the color palette. Oh, and I just thought it was so successful. Thanks. Yeah, one funny note for this is, anyone, do any of you guys play Minecraft? Okay, so you know when you're in Minecraft and you fall into a snow block and then it starts freezing and your screen gets those like cracks as it comes in? That was the idea for how, the, um, how I wanted it to make it feel extra cold. Like you're looking through a screen at her and it's kind of cracking up on you, you know? <laughs> Whenever I do alters on this card for people, I kind of draw the cracks into the rest of it. So it feels like Minecraft. <laughs> yeah, like uh, Deborah mentioned, it's frigid, it's freezing. You have this overwhelming uh, light blue, you know, cerulean hue to it. But the gold accents really yeah. give it some depth, uh, pun intended. And then mechanically speaking, of course, that's exactly what the merfolk do. If you know what the card does, right? It's supposed to freeze and lock down creatures for a turn. So flavorfully, we're, we're pulling you down into the lake, you know? And lakes and fairy tales are not a happy place. Um, this, this painting, I love it. Even just the split of the, of the tails, right? Traditionally, merfolk have one long tail, but this veers off and it sort of frames the figure in a lovely way. So, uh, yeah, this is one of my favorites from the, from the set. Yeah. <laughs> Before we open the q and I have a very simple question uh, for each of you. What was your favorite solve? Like, how are you looking back on Eldraine now that it's out in the wild? Um, what, what, are you so, what are you proud of? I mean, maybe, yeah, what, why don't we start with you, Deborah? Go ahead. Oh. I keep bringing it up, but again, the humor. Um, Andrew and I talk so much about that because one thing we wanted to emphasize is that people here can be happy. Cool. Um, that they can have lives. They, they have to move on. They can, they can grieve and they can experience their trauma, uh, but they also have to live with it and they also have to keep, you know, moving one foot in front of the other. And it was. A, a, a palate cleanser from the uh, Phyrexian invasion. And 
asking the artist to like have fun with it and to to like really lean into like uh, expression and like uh, like body elasticity and like physical humor and emotional storytelling. And I think that was like I'm really really proud of how successfully integrated that was with the entire set. Cool. How about you, Neil? Yeah, I'm just so proud of the conceptors and artists navigating what might not seem like it, but a very difficult set in that we had 10 stories we had to tell. It's not often that we're thinking uh, of a set as 10 distinct different stories that we're trying to have a narrative goal for. So I was just so impressed that when we were giving these to artists, they understood how to just cut apart each story into perfect illustrations. So when you arrange them in your draft deck or in your sealed pool or in your commander deck, you think, oh, I'm playing this story. You get to immerse yourself in the world and you know, play with the fairy tales. Uh, mix and match them if you want. But we, we just accomplished something that I didn't think when I was doing it anyone would notice. And then when it came out into the wilds, I was like, people understood. So I was yeah. so proud of that. Awesome. Yeah. OK, you think I'm going to say fairies, but it was the bee sheep. I think like <laughs> coming up with an idea that's like, just like good is so hard. Like, because if you don't have to like visually, ex like you can draw anything good, right? But like in order to come up with an idea where you're like, that's a great idea. I feel like that's so rare, even for us as concept artists that do this all day, you know? And I think that combining, because it's a specific type of sheep. If you look at those bee sheep, it's these little cute, like they're like the Wallace and Gromit sheep, right? They have these little black bodies, these super furry heads, and you can't see their eyes. So in order to make a bee sheep not creepy, right, it's actually kind of hard. Like, I think if I asked, like, a bunch of people to draw a bee sheep, we'd come up with a bunch of, like, Phyrexian horrors, you know? So to like, come up with something that's cute, like, it makes sense, everyone looks at it, and they're like, oh my god, that's so cute, it's a bee sheep, you know? And you don't, you, no words, no explanation, it's just good. And I think that's so rare for me that I'm still really excited about the, the beeps. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to correct you, but the correct terminology is beep. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the behemoths, you <laughs> the know? <beeps>. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, yeah, how about you? Uh, well, I think probably my favorite was the, uh, the work that I ended up putting into the dwarves, because they were a, a faction from the first Eldraine set. Um, and they had a little bit of concept art behind them, but not as much as you'd expect. And they had a few cards that, you know, ended up in the final art, which actually helped define them a little bit better. But there's still uh, a lot of work that we had to put into them to sort of you know, get them where they needed to be. Because they weren't just the dwarves as they used to exist, they were the dwarves in this kind of new world where the world had almost ended, and they sort of had to reevaluate living life uh, just being a miner all day. You know, they, they, they had a society built around a kind of traditional folklore dwarf. Uh, so they spent a lot of time with a, a pickaxe in their hand and not a lot of time enjoying life. Whereas now, they sort of realized that, you know, life is short and it's time to enjoy yourself. Um, so we were calling them the party dwarves, uh, and that was because they're basically the, uh, the Cinderella's ball. And their, their party needed to be uh, sort of adapted from uh, the practical tools and elements that they had laying around their, their dwarven kingdom. And their, uh, their halls, you know, needed to be kind of dressed up for the, for the occasion. So there was a lot of room for interpreting stuff in a really, in a really fun way. Um, and when, uh, when Andrew assigned the, the dwarves to me, he was like, uh, We'd all been sort of taking stabs at it. And he was like, so I, I want somebody to really use their sense of humor on this one. So Jason, <laughs> you should take a shot at it um, and just get really silly with it. So I did. Uh, and it was incredibly fun. And a lot of it you know, ended up in cards that I didn't expect it to. The, uh, the minecart racer was one that I came up with. Uh, I just thought it would be funny if they were sort of repurposing minecarts to have some sort of a party game. Yeah. Um, so that that was that was a lot of fun. It, it was uh, it was just being fairly silly and sort of exploring, and a surprising number of ideas ended up getting into the into the final. Yeah. Also, the minstrosity was one that I did not expect to get through. <laughs> uh, that one I originally called something like a peppermint predator, and I knew that was going <laughs> to change. Um, but uh, but yeah, the the candy monsters were one of those things where we were working on it, and we were like, this is never going to get into the set, but it ended up working out just fine. Yeah, I don't think you knew this, but when you were working on those dwarves, like me and Jayhan were together working on that push at the same time. And then every time you posted something, we'd be like, hey, come look at what Jason just posted. Because it was always amazing. It was so funny. And like, I feel like it was like so rare to see someone like getting to do that kind of stuff on a magic push. Because usually it's like serious planeswalkers fighting each other, you know, not like right. dwarves partying, you know. So that was really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this push had a lot of room for just having fun and, and getting a little bit crazy with it. Because um, yeah. the, the modern fairy tale has so much room for whimsy 
combined with the, the darker edges. And it gave us as artists a lot, of, a lot of tools to build with all at the same time and, and come up with just a, a, a fun combination. So I lied to you, we don't have time for Q&A. Sorry, so sorry. Um, but my last announcement before we go is, um, of course, they are, um, both Evan and Jason are here today. This is our last day at the con, they're at their booths. If you have a specific question from the level of concept, I'd love for you to just stop by the booth and ask it there. And um, of course, if you have cards to sign, that's also great. Um, as you can tell, they have a ton of fun. Like it's, so, it's such a joy to jump in these meetings because they're already, they have all this stuff that they've been working on for a year or two in, 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 in the works and we finally get to talk about it. Um, can I have one warm round of applause for my guests, please? That was really wonderful. Thank you. And again, I hope you learned something new. I hope you just walk away with a detail like, ah, doorways and fairy tales means a passage into a world unknown. Uh, I'll answer my own question. My favorite, undeniably, is Sir Ginger. I'm sorry. That's just, <laughs> I cannot get over Sir Ginger. It's the highlight of this weekend for me, and I'm going to claim that as my own. So <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful last day at the con. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you.